Everyone. Welcome to today's LACNETS webinar, Focus on Lung Carcinoid Tumors, with Dr. Robert Ramirez. I'm Lindsay Judavine, the Director of Communications for LACNETS. And I'm Lisa Yen, the Program Director for LACNETS. Before we get started, I'd like to take a second to thank Rich at TVP Live for making today's webinar and high-quality production possible. Please remember, as a reminder, these webinars are done for educational purposes only and do not substitute for medical advice. Please talk to your medical team if you have any questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. We all have our own opinions, and these are our own opinions. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of LACNETS. Now I'm going to pass it off to Lisa. Thank you, Lindsay. LACNETS is a program by GeneratePossibility.org, a registered nonprofit, and it stands for the Los Angeles Carcinoid Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. Our mission is to provide education, advocacy, and support for all people impacted by this rare disease that used to be known as carcinoid, an old term meaning cancer-like. The more accurate term is neuroendocrine tumor, or NET for short. You'll often hear us say neuroendocrine cancer, not only because it's a patient-friendly way to say the other term, neuroendocrine neoplasm, but also because we understand NET is a type of cancer and not cancer-like or benign, as previously thought. While you often see Lindsay and I leading the meetings and programs, we are in fact led by a team, which includes our interim administrator and board member, Kavya Velikaputi, board member Donna Gavin, who is also the sister of LACNET's founder and executive director emeritus, Giovanna Joyce Mbasi. And our board includes Mary Dunleavy, who has been living and thriving with NET for 16 years. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Robert Ramirez. Dr. Ramirez is a medical oncologist who specializes in lung nets, ranging from diffuse idiopathic neuroendocrine tumor cell hyperplasia, otherwise known as dip neck, and carcinoid tumors, to small cell lung cancers and other high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas. When he last joined us a year ago for our 2020 LACNES annual conference, he was joining us virtually, of course, from New Orleans, where he had spent nearly a decade with the New Orleans, Louisiana Neuroendocrine Tumor Specialist, or NOLA NETS. He has since relocated to Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, where he now serves the NET community. One silver lining of the pandemic is the virtual world that allows us to have Dr. Ramirez join us from wherever he is. We're grateful for his dedication and service to the NET community. Welcome, Dr. Ramirez. Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Ramirez. I am a medical oncologist at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. I specialize in the treatment of patients with neuroendocrine malignancies and thoracic cancers. Uh, I want to thank the folks at LACNETS for this invitation to discuss the workup and management of pulmonary carcinoid tumors and also dip neck. So I want to start out by saying that pulmonary neuroendocrine tumors do represent a diverse group of malignancies. Um, we categorize them as in a couple different categories called the pulmonary carcinoid tumors and also the neuroendocrine carcinomas. We don't particularly know what causes these cancers. Risk factors do vary. When we think of some of the higher grade neuroendocrine carcinomas, of the lung, we think smoking is the primary risk factor. But on the lower grade side, the pulmonary carcinoid tumors, we really don't know uh, many of the risk factors. Every now and again, there is a genetic syndrome associated with them, but that's only the minority of cases. There's really uh, the gamut varies as far as uh, patients who acquire this, and many have no risk factors at all. They are uncommon, and when we look at the totality of neuroendocrine tumors, the nets that arise from the lung represent about 25%. When we look at the totality of lung cancers, however, the low-grade pulmonary carcinoid tumors represent only about 2% of all lung cancers. I will say that the Incidence of neuroendocrine tumors across the board is increasing. This is a, a 
uh, SEER analysis from a few years back. And what you can see here is the incidents going all the way back to 1973 up until 2012. Throughout the, the gamut of neuroendocrine tumors, the incidence is increasing, and that line you see at the top is the increasing incidence of lung neuroendocrine tumors. So as oncologists, we're seeing more and more of these cancers in our practice, so it's really important to, to diagnose them correctly and manage them correctly. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the different types of lung neuroendocrine tumors, and they range um, from very indolent cancers to very aggressive, and I and I must stress, I said they are cancers uh, because they are they you know many times I see patients where they were told they had a benign tumor and there is no need for any follow up anymore, and that's certainly uh, not the way we we see things uh, because even the low grade uh, neuroendocrine. Uh, cancers can metastasize, which I'll allude to later on. So, so we break them essentially into four different categories, um, typical carcinoid, atypical carcinoid, large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas, and small cell lung cancer. So when we classify the neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, it's important to really define what they look like underneath the microscope. And when we first look at this, we want to say, do they have that neuroendocrine morphology and do the markers match what we're looking at to really define, is this a neuroendocrine tumor? And then within that, we look for to distinguish, is this a high grade or a, a low grade tumor? Uh, is this one of the pulmonary carcinoids or is this a large cell or a small cell carcinoma? Um, and one of the ways we do that is something called the mitotic index. And so if you think back to your high school biology classes, this is when cells divide. So we can see those mitoses when we look at it underneath the microscope. And so we can count those number of mitoses. And this is uh, what determines our mitotic index. So the pulmonary carcinoids, if we have less than two mitoses per 10 high powered fields, this is what we call a typical carcinoid tumor. If we have two to 10, then that falls into that atypical carcinoid. And then there's also the presence or absence of necrosis. Uh, necrosis stands for means cell death. So this is what really delineates typical versus atypical carcinoid tumors. Now, when we look at some of the higher grade, we look at things like the mitotic index of more than 10 plus the presence of necrosis. And so we can really categorize those between the large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas and the small cell carcinomas. Now, as opposed to the GI and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, where KI67, which is also a proliferative marker, certainly has a role in grading, within the lung, we have found that the literature is somewhat varied, um, but I do believe there is a role and we certainly check it on our patients. Now, this is not part of the classification, but sometimes helps us determine some of the treatment options for our patients. So you can see on the left is a paper that looked at survival of patients between the KIs less than 5% and those over 5%. And what you see is those with over 5% seem to do much worse than those under 5%. On the right, a similar project, and this is from our group, and we looked at patients, KIs less than 2%, 2 to 10%, and over 10%, and those patients with that lower KI seem to do better. Now, again, this is one of the problems with using KI67 is there's not really a standardization. So in the neuroendocrine community, this is well recognized, and we're still trying to figure out how best to use KI67. But for right now, typical and atypical are defined only by mitotic index and the presence or absence of necrosis. So when we look at uh, their survival for patients with pulmonary carcinoid tumors and, and some of the neuroendocrine carcinomas, you can see the survival really varies with the typical carcinoid tumors having long survivals uh, followed by the atypical carcinoids having less in the way of that. And then when you go down the large cell and neuroendocrine carcinomas, the survival is is certainly not as, as good. But, but I think even within that, we're getting better at, at treatment of all of these uh, cancers. 
So how do patients uh, present? Um, so, so this is a cancer of the lung. Um, and so just like our usual lung cancers, um, you know, many times patients uh, present with patient, symptoms of shortness of breath, sometimes some wheezing, repeated infections can come along. Uh, many times we see patients who, who've been hospitalized for pneumonia several times before they, they find this. Um, cough can is certainly a symptom, um, plus or minus, uh, uh, coughing up blood, sometimes some chest pain. Uncommonly, patients can have hormonal syndromes. Um, um, we don't see a lot of this, but it certainly can happen. It's certainly not as common as those patients with the GI neuroendocrine tumors. And many times we see patients without any symptoms at all and patients who get an X-ray for another reason and are found to have a lung mass and, and go down this road uh, of workup and found to have a pulmonary carcinoid tumor. Um, so what is that workup? So um, generally, again, most of the time this starts with a, an abnormal chest x-ray if there's, if there, unless there are symptoms, uh, and this will normally lead to a CT of the chest. So you can see in the upper panel, this is a patient of mine with a large right-sided lung mass uh, that was discovered after symptoms of cough and including coughing up blood. We always include a CT of the abdomen during our workup to look for metastatic disease. And an MRI is also useful. It's generally the best test for the liver. With the neuroendocrine tumors, we also include functional imaging. So, and the reason we do this is most of these cancers can have certain types of receptors that allow us to determine different treatment options that patients may have. So in the past, an Octrea scan was uh, the standard technology. Now we don't use Octrea scans anymore. Um, I think maybe certain institutions will. And if you're at an institution that uses this, ask for a Dotatate PET-CT. And there's a few different ones that are available now, the Gallium 68 and also the Copper 64. And they're relatively equivalent as far as some of the pictures that we're going to see, but they're very useful and far superior to the Octrea scan. Um, so, so really uh, um, try, to, try to ask for um, a dotatate. And if you're not, if they're not able to accommodate you, it's probably best to go to a center where, um, um, where a dotatate is available. So how do we diagnose? Um, so similar to non-small cell and small cell lung cancers, we diagnose with a biopsy and looking at this underneath the microscope. Um, so there are certain uh, techniques that we'll use, a bronchoscopy or endobronchial ultrasound is done by the pulmonologist where they will insert a tube into the windpipe and be able to uh, do a biopsy through the wall of the airways to uh, get a piece of tissue. Sometimes we do a CT guided biopsy that's done by the radiologist. Uh, an endoscopic ultrasound is useful sometimes in, in patients who have tumors that are closer to the esophagus who we cannot get tissue from a bronchoscopy. A thoracentesis or a pericardiocentesis is useful for patients who have a fluid buildup either within the lung or within the sac surrounding the heart, and we can get tissue cells uh, from there uh, and get us a diagnosis. Uh, and sometimes we have to do this via a surgical biopsy uh, where we make a small incision and be able to sample tissue from there. Uh, but the biggest thing with, uh, with the neuroendocrine patients is it's really important to be part of a uh, multidisciplinary team. And I know this is, uh, uh, this is somewhat of a buzzword, but it's, it's, uh, it's really true in oncology um, and especially true for our thoracic and neuroendocrine patients. Uh, so we really, we sit down um, every week as part of a tumor board and meet with, uh, with our other specialties, including pathology and thoracic surgery and pulmonary and radiology and um, research. And, and so there's a whole host of uh, specialties that, that come up with uh, treatment recommendations from their own experience. And, and we often uh, will send patients to other specialties for, for, uh, for help with this. So it's really uh, important to be part of that multidisciplinary team. 
people often ask, what's my stage? And this is a really important question because this really defines what we're going to be able to do moving forward as far as treatment and also how patients are, are going to do. So essentially, the earlier stage means the smaller the tumor, the less uh, it has spread. And so what you can see in the top left, this is a stage one tumor. So you can see the tumor sitting there has not spread to any lymph nodes. Um, when you move over to the stage two tumors, you can see that the cancer has spread to the first set of lymph nodes there. So that really defines that stage two cancer. The stage three cancer is spread further. Sometimes a, a larger tumor uh, is spread to further down the lymph node chain. And then that stage four cancer is that cancer that has spread to other areas of the body. Um, and most commonly we see spread to other lung. Sometimes we see this spread to the liver or bone. Sometimes patients end up with fluid or effusions of the lung or heart um, and, and uh, that defines stage four disease as well. Now, just because it's stage four disease doesn't mean that we don't have very good treatment options, and I'll talk about some of those uh, next. So early stage disease is generally treated with surgical resection. Uh, we follow the, the guidelines based on the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer, um, and traditionally uh, we consider the lobectomy the gold standard, uh, but there is some literature to support the role of what we call sublobar uh, resections or something less than taking a, uh, an entire lobe. Uh, there's possibly a role for stereotactic body radiotherapy. Um, we use this a lot in non-small cell lung cancer and there's some data uh, to support its use in pulmonary carcinoid tumors. Adjuvant therapy or therapy after resection for pulmonary carcinoid tumors is, is somewhat controversial, um, and I'll talk about that as well. So these are the types of surgical procedures. Um, this is just a cartoon that you'll hear some of us talk about and may hear your surgeon talk about. Um, so we start out with, uh, on the top is a wedge resection, and it's simply that, it's taking a little slice of the pie, and this is done for those uh, peripheral lesions um, that can be easily taken out. Now, generally, this is not something that we do, um, the wedge resections, um, because it's sort of uh, an incomplete operation and sometimes doesn't give us everything that we need. In non-small cell lung cancer, we know that wedge resections are associated with a higher risk of recurrence down the line. So the next up is a segmentectomy. So there's, uh, this is one of those sublobar resections um, that, where they actually take an anatomic segment uh, from the lung. Uh, now, it's important to get lymph nodes associated with all of these surgeries as well, so we really know how the accurate stage the lobectomy is also shown there where they take the entire lobe. Um, this is followed by the pneumonectomy, which where the entire lung is taken. And then there's something called a sleeve pneumonectomy, where they this is done for those proximal lesions where they can actually piece back or tie that uh, the existing lung back into the windpipe. So I mentioned there may be a role for stereotactic body radiotherapy or SBRT. Um, some people call this uh, SABR as well. So in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, there's lots of data to support the use of this. Uh, and this is simply targeted, very focused radiation to directly to the tumor. Uh, and it's normally done over a short period of time, normally three to five treatments of radiation with a low risk of side effects associated with this. And in the non-small cell world, this is very effective. If you think about it, in many of our, many of our patients who have non-small cell lung cancer, the primary driver for that is smoking. Um, and so normally before surgery, we check pulmonary function testing or PFTs. And sometimes if we're doing a lung cancer operation, the lung function is not good enough to tolerate an operation. So this is sometimes the next best thing. So we looked at some of our patients with carcinoid tumors who are not candidates for surgery or didn't want surgery uh, for whatever reason and saw how 
how they would do with the uh, SBRT. And you can see the, the slide on the left is a, you see the tumor sitting there. Um, this person got five days of radiation. Uh, and you can see several months later, a significant improvement in, in their disease. There's other interventions, things like cryo, um, ablation, and these kind of things. And you know, I think some of it is works in non-small cell lung cancer, and we, there's no reason it shouldn't work. We just don't have the large series to really report out and, and really say this is beneficial, given the rarity of this disease. So is there a role for therapy following resection, or what we call adjuvant therapy? Again, some of this comes from the non-small cell lung cancer world uh, where we think adjuvant therapy is beneficial and certainly in, in non-small cell lung cancer, it, it, we have very good um, trials that tell us this is beneficial. Uh, within the pulmonary carcinoid tumors, there's not that level of data. And so what you can see here is uh, we reviewed this literature recently, and this, this was actually just published earlier this week, which where we looked at some of the guidelines and looked at some of the literature throughout the lung carcinoid world and really found there's a limited amount of data to justify the use of adjuvant therapy throughout the stages. So if we published last year uh, a COMNETS and NANETS guideline that really looked at those typical and atypical carcinoid tumors and really came out and said, we recommend surgery without the use of adjuvant therapy, citing limited data. Now, some of the other organizations such as ENETS, NCCN, and ESMO, they sort of reserve that chemotherapy for those patients with a stage three atypical carcinoid tumors. Now, again, they also go on to say that there's not very good data to support the use of this. So I think it's really important that more research needs to be done in this, uh, but given the fact that this is a rare cancer, it makes it very difficult. Neuroendocrine tumors do metastasize. Uh, this is a slide from several years back that looks at the frequency of metastasis. And you can see in lung, they can metastasize up to a quarter of the time. So even though sometimes people think these are what I, I've heard described as benign tumors, these are real cancers and they all have the ability to metastasize. Uh, so they need surveillance uh, at the very least. The good thing is there's multiple options uh, for treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. You know, I've defined some of these things here, uh, surgery, some of the somatostatin analogs. You'll, you'll often hear people us talk about embolization or ablation. Uh, the exciting thing is the radionuclide therapy. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There's chemotherapy, uh, different types, possible role for immunotherapy, some of the target therapies, and clinical trials. But when we look at FDA approved treatments for advanced pulmonary carcinoid tumors, we really only have one, which is Everolimus. Uh, not that we don't use the rest of these, but again, that somewhat, uh, this is where that multidisciplinary team really comes in to really determine the best approach for your cancer. So I'll talk a little bit about the somatostatin analogs. Um, so there, we have a couple different uh, trials for these patients. So one is called the PROMID study, uh, which looked at patients with small intestine neuroendocrine tumors and randomized them to either octreotide or placebo. And then the Clarinet study, which looked at patients with gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and randomized them to either lanreotide or placebo. Now, you can see that both of these agents seem to have an improvement in progression-free survival or that time until uh, patients progressed while they were on it. Um, but I will say these were done, again, in those mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors and also those GEPNETs. So what evidence do we have for lung? Well, there, we have a lot of retrospective data and really the best way to design a study is a, in a prospective fashion. Well, the Spinet study was a study designed to really look at the use of lanreotide in patients with those metastatic or locally advanced unresectable pulmonary carcinoid tumors. They hoped to have 216 patients, and these patients were randomized two to one between lanreotide versus placebo. 
This study closed approximately 2018, I believe, because of slow accrual. Um, and it's not until this year where we are actually going to be getting some results on the patients who are randomized. So at the time of airing, the results will be available uh, in the coming days. Uh, I believe this will be uh, at ESMO, which happens about, I think it's being presented about three days after the airing of, of this presentation. So stay tuned for that. We're all anxiously awaiting the results. I spoke about Everolimus. This is an agent that's called an mTOR inhibitor that inhibits a certain pathway that these cancers use to grow. Again, this is a study that looked at patients with lung and GI neuroendocrine tumors. This is the lung cohort, and what they found was a 52% reduction in the relative risk of progression or death compared by placebo. So again, this is an important study and it's an important agent. So this is something that we use all the time uh, for patients with the lung neuroendocrine tumors. There's a newer agent that is currently with the FDA called surafatinib. Now this is a, another oral agent which inhibits the VEGF and FGF pathways, which inhibit angiogenesis or the formation of blood vessels. There's early phase trials, which had encouraging anti-tumor activity. And this was later demonstrated in phase three trials called the SANET-P and the SANET-EP, uh, or pancreas and extra pancreatic, uh, versus placebo. And this is the EP, or the extra pancreatic study, which looked at close to 200 patients that were randomized between surfatinib and placebo. 9% of those patients were lung. So again, a uh, somewhat underrepresented uh, population, but nonetheless, uh, they were represented. And what they found was a median progression-free survival of 9.2 months versus 3.8 months favoring the surfatinib. And the most common adverse reactions of grade three or higher were hypertension or, or protein in the urine. And these are very common side effects of these types of agents. So this is currently being reviewed by the FDA, uh, but hopefully this will give us another option for treatment for patients. There is a trial uh, looking at the use of surafatinib plus immunotherapy that you can see here. We just opened this trial at Vanderbilt, um, and this is actually looking at patients with advanced or metastatic solid tumors and looking at that combination. So you can see several different cohorts there, uh, including thoracic neuroendocrine tumors. So, so hopefully we'll get a good idea if this surafatinib plus immunotherapy may be beneficial. All right, I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about PRRT or peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. So this is a very exciting um, type of therapy that has been around in the United States for the for the last few years, um, and and I think around the world um, much longer. Um, so essentially, this is a type of targeted radiation. Um, so. So again, I had mentioned earlier that the neuroendocrine tumors have certain types of receptors, so something called somatostatin receptors on their, on their surface. And so what we can do is we can take advantage of that. So we will link a somatostatin analog, which will bind to those somatostatin receptors to a radionuclide. So the one we use in the United States right now, which is FDA approved, is lutetium. Lutetium and that somatostatin analog complex binds to that somatostatin receptor. This gets internalized into that neuroendocrine cell and emits the beta radiation, causing cellular damage uh, by the formation of free radicals and cell death. So, Part of the reason this was FDA approved was from the Netter 1 study that looked at patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, which were metastatic or locally advanced and inoperable, uh, and randomized them to either lutetium-177 versus a higher dose of octreotide LAR. So these patients were on octreotide prior and what they did was they said, all right, once you progress on octreotide, we will randomize you to either 
the PRRT versus doubling the dose of the octreotide LAR. And what they were looking for is uh, an improvement in progression-free survival. This is the results. Uh, so you can see that um, vast improvement of progression-free survival. And then the interim analysis also looked like an improvement in overall survival as well. So this led to that FDA approval, which happened in January of 2018. Now, I will caution that this is in patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. So does this work in patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors? Well, we think that it does. There's lots of data to support the use of PRRT in those patients with uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see here the studies I highlighted uh, have 100% pulmonary neuroendocrine tumors with their progression-free survival actually appearing to be better than those than that in the Netter one study and with higher response rates as well. So again, this is retrospective, but this is the best data that we have thus far. And because of this, most of the guideline committees, including NANETS and ENETS and NCCN, approve PRRT for patients with neuroendocrine tumors of the lung. So that's very important, especially when we're looking at uh, getting this approved by insurance. It's, it's important to have that guideline approval. So this is certainly a consideration for treatment. Now, I mentioned two different treatments already, everolimus and, and also PRRT. So how do you decide what patients go first? Um, well, uh, sometimes that's, that, again, that's part of that multidisciplinary team to make that decision. But this is a trial called the COMPETE trial, which is actually looking at this question. So they're uh, randomizing patients to either PRRT up front or Everolimus up front. Uh, but again, I'll caution this is in uh, those GEPNET patients. So we'll see, uh, we'll see if this makes a difference in which one should come first, hopefully in the coming years. Another type of therapy that we are very excited about is something called targeted alpha therapy. So the beta emitters have a higher energy uh, and larger penetration range, um, but sometimes that can come with the chair side effects. The alpha particles, on the other hand, have a higher probability of double-strand DNA breaks and a shorter range, sometimes minimizing the effect to some of the healthy tissue. And there's a whole host of targeted alpha therapies that, that you can see that are in various uh, levels of, of studying right now. So this is a uh, actinium-225 in a patient who is a heavily pretreated grade 2 neuroendocrine tumor. And what you can see at baseline on the left, you can see widespread disease uh, throughout the chest and liver and also abdomen. And you can see after completion of treatment, a significant decrease in the burden of disease. Last year at Nanets, we learned of a phase one study using lead 212. Uh, this was a first in human study that in 16 patients were presented with metastatic or unresectable somatostatin receptor positive neuroendocrine tumors. And these also included small bowel, pancreas, and lung. No prior PRRT was allowed. So this is that first line PRRT study. And what they found was an objective response rate of 83%. Uh, so very high responses. So if, if we remember back to the Netter 1 study, the objective response rate was about 18% in that study. Uh, so much higher here. There was no clinically significant drug-related toxicity up to 18 months, except hair loss, quality of life was improved for these patients and a dramatic decrease in tumor burden. At that meeting, they showed two different lung net patients, and you can see on the top uh, a patient with a large volume of disease, and even after just a short amount of treatment, two injections, you can see that um, a very significant improvement, uh, and after completion of therapy, it looks like a uh, complete response there uh, that seemed to be maintained as well. 
Uh, similarly, in the bottom window, you can see uh, someone with a, a very large burden of disease in the chest. After treatment, this is significantly improved in that duration was uh, maintained. So this is something that we're very excited about uh, and, and hopefully will be coming to a clinic in the coming years. I want to put a plug in for clinical trials. I mean, this is really, I, I, I presented a lot of this uh, this information, and really everything that we do is based on clinical trials. Uh, the clinical trials um, vary uh, by inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, and they vary by where you're at in the country. Uh, so, so I may have clinical trials here that are not available even down the down the road. Um, but we always, you know, it's always important to ask your doctor about, you know, what clinical trials are available, and and if I qualify for for these, what are the potential side effects? And, and so it's really important to, uh, to, to get access to all of those options um, so you can make an informed decision on your treatment. All right, so, so in, the, in the last few minutes, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, a, a really uncommon entity called DIPNEC or diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. So this is a rare disease. Uh, in fact, the largest case series was, was, was just published, had 59 patients, uh, and this was out of Mayo Clinic, and it took them 19 years to generate 59 patients uh, who'd come through their center with this disease. So this is actually uh, a diffuse proliferation of the neuroendocrine uh, cells limited to the basement membrane. It tends to affect women, uh, but men can certainly be affected with this. And in what we think is it's probably a pre-neoplastic condition, meaning that this comes before development of a carcinoid cancer. But it can be present with or without carcinoid tumors. So this is a um, relatively new entity. This is actually the first report of DIPNEC. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1992, so not that long ago, where they actually described six patients uh, that came through with similar symptoms that I'll discuss here in a few minutes. Uh, interestingly, two of them were men out of this uh, six patient series. And if we fast forward to today, what have we learned about this? So this is uh, our PubMed database that looks at all of the medical literature. And if you type in dip neck and search for it, you come up with only 140 results dating back to 1992. So again, rare disease, misunderstood, um, and, uh, and we need more research into this. Um, so what are the symptoms? Uh, some are very nonspecific. Um, some patients have no symptoms. Uh, so most of the time, this is cough and shortness of breath. Uh, and this can go undiagnosed for many years um, or get confused with other entities such as asthma or COPD. Um, it's picked up uh, many times incidentally, so a chest x-ray or a CT showing uh, pulmonary nodules. And the way you diagnose this is, is primarily with a surgical resection. So, um, so the more tissue we have, the better. Sometimes we can, we can look at this with uh, a needle biopsy. There's some literature to support the clinical diagnosis, meaning looking at symptoms alone, and then also looking at the imaging uh, to say this is consistent with a diagnosis of dip neck. Uh, pulmonary function testing is important with patients as well. Um, and most commonly, we, we, we certainly can see a mixed pattern. Most commonly, we see this obstructive pattern so that it goes along with the COPD or asthma. Uh, but we can see really a gamut of restrictive patterns, mixed patterns, or uh, uh, sometimes patients have uh, uh, normal pulmonary, pulmonary function testing. So, so it's important when you have this diagnosis is to really get that pulmonary function testing to see where you're at and see how it improves over time with treatment. Um, so this is a patient of mine who was incidentally diagnosed. So she, this, uh, this is, uh, you can see a, a, a large pulmonary carcinoid tumor on the left side of her chest, uh, but multiple pulmonary nodules scattered throughout. And then there's something called this mosaic attenuation that is characteristic of the scan that you see with patients with this. 
This is another patient of mine, young woman who had a, a chronic cough, uh, had a CT 14 years prior to her diagnosis, showing multiple pulmonary, pulmonary nodules. Um, most recent CT had shown progression, but nonetheless, this was something that had been present for many years uh, in this patient. So this is a series of patients uh, with confirmed dip neck. Uh, and I think the thing I want to point out with this is a couple things. Is One, patients can be asymptomatic, such as those in this group two. Uh, Ten of them were asymptomatic uh, and picked up incidentally. Um, but the other thing I want to point out is this mean duration of illness prior to diagnosis. So this is almost nine years um, patients had this before they were diagnosed. So again, it's an uncommon entity that we really need to be aware of uh, because, you know, many patients go on treatment with steroids and inhalers with varying success, uh, but there may be other things that, that may be beneficial. So this is that large case series I alluded to from Mayo um, that, that looked at some of the how patients present uh, and the majority of them were symptomatic. Uh, the majority had bilateral nodules and mosaic attenuation, and they'd gone through many of the inhaled steroid treatments, the oral steroid treatments, and 15% of them in this series that actually had somatostatin analogs. Uh, you can see about half of them had progression of their disease, and uh, about 17% had progressed into a lung neuroendocrine tumor. So I mentioned somatostatin analogs. Um, so this is one of the treatment options that may be beneficial for patients. This was a series of patients we had treated that four of them had somatostatin analogs and all of them had either resolution or symptom improvement with the use of somatostatin analogs. There's another series published recently that looked at 42 patients on somatostatin analogs. Uh, and this was a mix of both either octreotide LAR or lanreotide. And on the left, what you can see is the majority of patients either had a mild, moderate, or significant improvement in their symptoms, uh, but a quarter of patients uh, did not have improvement. So normally what I do is I'll put patients on this for several months and see if they improve. Um, and if they improve, meaning with their cough and shortness of breath, we will continue them on. Sometimes it's a subtle improvement where patients won't, won't even recognize much of an improvement at all until they actually come off of it and say, you know what, my cough was actually better while I was on treatment. So then we put them back on. But, so, but again, sometimes this does not uh, help patients. Um, they also looked at those uh, pulmonary function testings. Uh, and you can see that the majority of patients uh, had improvement in their pulmonary function testing. So, but there's many unanswered questions with dip neck. Um, if it's a pre-malignant process, why don't all patients progress? Uh, you know, why don't all lung carcinoid patients also have dip neck? And why are some dip neck patients symptomatic and, and why not? And, and importantly, and what, you know, some of the things that we're looking at is, is there a molecular signature that predicts uh, progression or symptoms? So, so there's lots and lots of research uh, um, that should be directed uh, towards this, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll have more answers in the, in the coming years. So finally, I want to talk about COVID a little bit. Um, you know, COVID obviously has affected all of us in some way, uh, it has really changed, uh, you know, how we practice medicine um, and uh, what we look for in, in patients and, how we, and how, we, how we treat patients, especially with the neuroendocrine tumors in the lung. Um, you know, for the, for the most part, this is a respiratory illness. And so patients with, uh, with neuroendocrine tumors of the lung are already compromised from a respiratory standpoint. So it's really, really important that patients take whatever precautions they need to, uh, including vaccines, uh, to, uh, to really try to avoid getting infected with this. There's lots of resources for education for uh, COVID for neuroendocrine patients um, in, that you see here. I encourage uh, people to take a look at this. Um, recently, the CDC has recommended that moderately and severely immunocompromised patients receive an additional dose or a booster vaccine. 
And importantly for my patient population, patients will ask, am I immunocompromised? You know, the, the white blood cell count may be normal. Uh, I may not have other signs of immunocompromised. But one of their definitions in this is those patients who've been receiving active cancer treatment for tumors or cancer of the blood. So those patients who are on those somatostatin analogs or PRRT, these are the patients who should be considering a booster injection. We are expecting that uh, that all, all patients uh, may be uh, offered booster injections in the, in the coming months, so time will tell. And, and as we've, we've learned, this virus changes uh, all the time, so the recommendations need to change as well. So, so I encourage everyone to, to talk to your doctor about what the best treatment options are for you. So I'll sum it up um, by saying, you know, the, the neuroendocrine tumors of the lung really represent a diverse uh, uh, spectrum of disease, um, from those slow-growing cancers to the to the fast-growing cancers. We didn't talk about uh, any of the um, the neuroendocrine carcinomas, but we're, but as I alluded to, we're getting better at at treating them. Um, the again, the the even those low-grade pulmonary carcinoid tumors have the potential to metastasize. So at the bare minimum, we need ongoing surveillance once these, once these cancers are taken out. The therapies uh, continue to evolve um, and, and really remember the clinical trials. They kind of come and go, uh, but that's, that's really uh, how we generate um, the standard of care options. So, um, so I will stop there. My email is, is at the bottom of this slide. Please feel free to um, contact me with questions you have moving forward. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the question and answer session. Thanks so much. Dr. Ramirez, thank you for that truly excellent presentation. That was really um, just a lot of information. And uh, there's so several questions that have already come in. Um, but before we dive into the Q&A, just a couple of reminders for the audience. Um, as you all know, we get a lot of questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible, but unfortunately it's not possible to get to all the questions. Um, and we're gonna try today to stick to the topic of lung nets. So feel free to reach out to us by email and we can try to answer your questions or direct it um, to the appropriate party. And also feel free to submit your question again for a future program. Um, again, a reminder um, that all our programs are intended for educational purposes only and do not substitute for medical advice. Talk to your medical team if you have any questions or concerns about your individual case or treatment. So now with all that out of the way, Dr. Ramirez, welcome back. And if you will, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in lung nets. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me back. I always um, enjoy talking with you and, and, and your group. Uh, certainly, I always get uh, really good questions, and uh, it's, it's always a good time. So. Um, so I'm a, I'm a thoracic oncologist. Uh, I've, uh, I'm currently at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. I actually just moved here, uh, started here in April of this year. Um, and so we're, we're seeing lots and lots of, of uh, patients with the neuroendocrine tumors of the lung. Um, and we've got a full-fledged neuroendocrine program um, uh, with, uh, with taking care of all different types of, of neuroendocrine tumors and not just lung. I, I, I primarily see the lungs, uh, but Dr. Nanu Das uh, takes care of the, the GI and the pancreas nets. Uh, uh, we run clinical trials. We do lots and lots of PRRT. So, so there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of resources here. Um, so prior to this, as you had mentioned, I was in New Orleans uh, uh, for a long time uh, at at, uh, at the NOLA Nets program, uh, and and really trying to uh, trying to do uh, that similar uh, uh, similar research and taking care of uh, patients uh, from from around the country and trying to advance the field as well. Uh, so uh, so. My primary uh, focus is is on uh, lung cancer, including those neuroendocrine tumors, um, uh, uh, in, and also in, including research. and I and I teach fellows and residents as well. Yeah, and how did you get into lung nets in particular? So it's interesting. So so in my fellowship, I was really interested in lung cancer. 
Um, so non-small cell and small cell lung cancers. And so, you know, the, the neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, they, they represent a, uh, especially the low grade ones, they represent a, um, a minority of, of tumors. So when I moved to Louisiana, um, I became involved with the Nolanex program. And that's really when I, when I became interested in the neuroendocrine tumors of the lung. At that time, they weren't seeing a whole lot of this. They were more focused on the, on the GI and pancreas uh, rectal neuroendocrine tumors. So I decided to make that my specialty and, and kind of fill that, fill that void. Yeah, thank you for filling that void. As you and I have discussed, there are many people who come to the groups and programs and a common question we hear is that there's this gap of knowledge and they feel a little bit left out. And so we wanted to dedicate this program just for the lung nets. Um, so with that being said, let's, let's get to some of these questions because I know that many people want to have their questions answered. So um, one of the first questions is what's your best guess about how many dip neck patients there are in the US and around the world? It's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, the, the, as, I, as I put up in that slide, uh, you've got 100 and 140, I think, uh, um, publications in the world literature on Dipneck. And so this dates back to 1992. So again, there's not a, there's not a whole lot. The Mayo Group, it took them almost 20 years to generate data on 59 patients. So so, so how, but I think, I think as, as more people are recognizing this entity, I think uh, there's going to be more and more uh, uh, papers such as the, the Mayo uh, paper and maybe with more patients. So, so, so I think we're going to be seeing more and more of this in, in the coming years. And I think it's all, it's up to us to really, um, figure out what to do with this. I, you know, there's with these rare with these rare uh, entities, it's hard to really say this is exactly what we should be doing uh, because it's such a small population. So even with uh, with the lung carcinoid tumor population, again, this only represents about two percent of all neuroendocrine tumors. So that I, I I showed you that data, or I showed you that the Spinet trial using lanreotide. That, that was open for, for several years before closing, and it closed because, because they didn't have enough patients. Um, so, so it's going to be hard to, you know, obviously in, in our field, we want those randomized controlled studies, these large studies. You know, you look at the breast cancer, you know, uh, trials, and they have hundreds and sometimes thousands of patients in their trial. I mean, we'll never get there, but, that, but that's okay. We'll, you know, we'll... You know, we'll try to generate whatever um, data we can and try to try to advance that field. You know, even with these patients with the rare tumor, so we have something to look back. We're, we're and, and say this is what's best. We're always looking for the data uh, to or the evidence of proof that that what we're doing is actually helpful. Yeah, that's really helpful to hear. And again, because this is the rare of the rare. I'm glad that you um, really went into quite a bit about clinical trials and how important that is um, to get the uh, appropriate data. Um, so again, another dip neck question. For dip neck patients, is there a def definite point where the tumorlet becomes a tumor? Um, this person has he heard everything from 0.6 centimeters to one centimeter. Yeah, generally, um, uh, pathologically speaking, the, the tumorlets are, are five millimeters. That's, that's where we normally make our cutoff. Um, radiographically, it may be a little bit different. Um, sometimes what you see on a scan is not what, what they take out of, of the patient. So when you have that surgical resection, something you see on a scan, maybe maybe one centimeter, for instance, and then when you look at it underneath the microscope in the largest dimension, maybe maybe smaller than that. So it really, it, it really uh, de depends um, on, on how, you're, how you're looking at this, but generally for a tumor like that cutoff is five millimeters. Okay, thank you. So that's 0.5 centimeters, so that's helpful. So again, that's very, very tiny. That's, that's, that's about half the size of a pea. Yeah, that's really small. Um, 
And here's another question about, you know, uh, net tumors in the lung. Are net tumors normally made up of one or the other cells, typical or atypical? Um, and secondly, are typical and atypical tumors addressed in the same manner? Yeah, so very good questions there. Um, so, so the typical, so what defines typical and atypical, uh, and that's the classification of, of the pulmonary carcinoid tumors. So what defines that is the mitotic index and also the presence or absence of necrosis. Um, so, so yes, it's certainly possible to have, have typical and atypical, especially when you're doing like a, a needle biopsy. So sometimes if you do a needle biopsy, maybe where they put the needle doesn't show that necrosis or the high mitotic index. So it gets labeled as a, it, it gets labeled as typical carcinoid. Uh, but then when the tumor actually comes out and we look at it underneath the microscope, then, then we say, oh, wait a minute, there's necrosis here, or that mitotic index is, is four, for instance, and then that, that, um, that can tell us that this is uh, an, an atypical rather than typical. So, so the more tissue that we have, the better. And even we, we had looked at this uh, in the small bowel tumors uh, a few years back, and, and looked at the disconcordance between a needle biopsy and also a surgical resection. So, and it turns out about a third of the time, the needle biopsy was wrong one way or the other and either uh, increase the grade or lower the grade at, at surgical resection. Uh, so, so, that, so that's the first part of that question. Uh, so the second part uh, are typical and atypical tumors addressed in the same manner. Generally speaking, so, so we, we tend to lump them together. So remember, when we're looking at that, that 2% of, of, of uh, lung cancers, when we look at the atypical ones, this is less than 1%. So the majority are typical carcinoids. So this is about half a percent are the atypicals. And, and yeah, the best data is to, to say, all right, surgical resection is up front. And then if it's, if it's metastatic, well, then we've got a whole host of other things. Now we tend to say if this is an atypical, um, maybe you know maybe they'll respond better to chemotherapy, so things like uh, um, capecitabine and temozolomide. Um, but yeah, I'm not afraid to use that same regimen in patients with with typical carcinoids either. Hmm. Thank you for that very thorough answer. And you, you mentioned surgery, so um, this question also was submitted for lung spots. At what point do they consider surgery to remove them? So um, that's a little bit confusing question for, I guess, uh, I guess we're talking about nodules or masses or, um, I mean, I think, I think really talking with, with your, with your doctor and, and being part of that multidisciplinary program. Earlier today, we just had our, our, our thoracic tumor board and we and we meet every week and we discuss these exact questions where where we will come with uh, with with a question for our surgeons and say all right here's our scans and here's here's how our patient presented and here's the biopsy and what is the next best step to to go do we radiate this do we take it out do we do do something else do we watch it so it really varies it's hard to it's hard to really say you know, uh, concrete. I think everything, everyone is, is different. Uh, but, but yeah, I think, I think for any of the, of, of the lung net patients, I think they should all be discussed in that multidisciplinary setting. Yeah. Yeah. As you point out, it's really important to have it reviewed with the multidisciplinary tumor board. Um, and this wasn't submitted, but I'm just wondering, um, just curious, what kind of multidisciplinary tumor board should it be reviewed by? A NETS one, a lung one? I mean, where would where should it be reviewed? It's a that's an excellent question. Uh, so here at Vanderbilt, we've got we've got both. So we've got a thoracic uh, uh, tumor board. We have a neuroendocrine tumor board. Um, we meet uh, every week and and discuss our patients. So sometimes. I will uh, present the same patient in both tumor boards uh, because it's not always the same individuals at at both tumor boards, and I may need, 
input from, say, nuclear medicine about a PRRT patient um, where, where I don't generally see uh, that, that nuclear med physician all the time at my thoracic tumor board, or I may need input from my thoracic surgeons where, where they may not be at the neuroendocrine tumor board. Uh, so, so it really, you know, um, it, I'm, I sort of have that luxury of being able to, to do that. Uh, I think at the bare minimum, um, they get discussed at, especially for lung, I, I think at the bare minimum, discussed at a, at a thoracic tumor board. Again, with thoracic surgery, pulmonary, radiology, uh, so, I mean, these, uh, radiation oncology. So these are the, the, the key players in, in that tumor board. That's helpful, okay, to name those kind of specialists that you're looking for. Um, and, you know, this question comes up, of course, uh, with all NETs, um, and I guess I'm wondering what your thoughts are on serotonin and its involvement with NETs. Yeah, certainly, uh, certainly serotonin can uh, cause lots, elevated serotonin can cause lots and lots of problems, um, uh, lots of, uh, uh, worsening of symptoms, and primarily we see this more with the with the uh, small bowel nets with the metastatic disease uh, uh, to the liver. We can certainly see this sometimes. It's occasional with uh, with the lung nets as well, and it's something that we'll look for, especially if someone has symptoms of that carcinoid syndrome um, consisting of uh, diarrhea and flushing and wheezing. We always want to also rule out any uh, uh, cardiac abnormalities. Patients can uh, uh, develop carcinoid heart disease. And, and so we're checking echoes on patients all the time and looking for, for, uh, for any issues with the valves. Sometimes we have to do valve replacements on patients. Uh, so it really, I mean, it, it, it really plays a role and we've got you know, the treatments to, to bring that down and whether it's through surgery or, or uh, including debulking surgery, sometimes liver directed therapy, there's medicines that we use can, can sometimes help bring it down as well. Um, but, but yeah, certainly uh, it's, a, it's a major uh, issue that we deal with and can, can cause lots of issues with patients. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned um, carcinoid syndrome. So can you have carcinoid syndrome after a lung that's removed and scans show no signs of disease. Um, with that, can you also experience carcinoid crisis during surgery or maybe other procedures? You know, people ask a lot about dental procedures, for example. Yeah, yeah, so this is a, an excellent question and I think uh, uh, kind of poorly understood. Um, you know, you think you get rid of the bulk of the tumor and, and um, the whole reason to do any sort of cytoreduction or debulking is to try to bring those hormone levels down. Um, but some patients we see from time to time that you take out a big part of their tumor or get rid of all of their tumor and we don't see anything on scans, but yet they still have uh, some ongoing symptoms, even though we can't find, we can't find anything on scans and we can't find anything on blood work, so we look at those the five HIAs and serotonins and, and other markers, and some you know sometimes we don't see any of that. Now, now those are the patients that are that are um, sometimes benefit from from those somatostatin analogs, um, and I and I think you know we also also always look for other causes of these symptoms as well. So. Especially in the lungs, we look for histamine that can cause symptoms similar to uh, the carcinoid syndrome. Uh, so, so these are other things. You know, we, if it's not making sense, we we dig a little deeper until we find out uh, um, until we find our answer. So, sometimes we don't find our answer, um, um, but we you know we treat the symptoms regardless. Um, now, in terms of carcinoid crisis, uh, it's. Uh, so carcinoid crisis, as, as you may know, it happens a lot of, sometimes with manipulation of tumors where, where patients can get an overwhelming release of hormones and cause issues with, with blood pressure. Um, and so we always try to prophylax against this. There's some newer data saying that, that maybe we're doing a little bit too much prophylaxis. Um, but at the same time, I think sometimes it's better to err on the side of, of caution. I think... Um, um, 
in my experience, those patients with with out any evidence of disease, the, these are the ones that are generally not getting into trouble. Um, but I always talk with the uh, you know, with the surgeons and the anesthesiologists, saying that well, here's the here is uh, where this patient has been at. This is the diagnosis, and maybe we need to have some octreotide at least on hand in case the patient gets into trouble. And we always you know provide them with access to us in case you know they're they're in the OR and have issues, they can get a hold of one of us and uh, uh, we can kind of direct what needs to happen next. Okay, so you stay on top of it. Um, what about uh, patients who are wondering about outpatient procedures, not necessarily surgery, but like dental procedures, wisdom tooth, that type of thing? Yeah, it's. I think it's really uncommon for, for something like that. Um, dental dental procedures I, I i think most of the i don't know if i don't know if i've heard of anyone getting into trouble with this um but i don't think it's unreasonable to bring your short acting octreotide if if you have that uh if if you have that carcinoid syndrome already if, if you don't have anything well then then it, i think it's really unlikely that you'll get into trouble okay okay yeah, and if they do, just come prepared, like you said. Okay. Um, so you you mentioned you know kind of uh, digging around echoes and all that um, and and scans. So what would be the best scan or labs for surveillance of lung nets? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think uh, so. So the way it gets worked up initially is is with the CT of the chest and abdomen. We want to make sure they're. Uh, it, we know about any metastatic disease. We always get that functional imaging with the Dota Tate PET CT, um, and that does two two different things. One, it can tell us if there's somatostatin receptors on that on the tumor surface, and it can also tell us is there any evidence of distant disease. So sometimes patients come uh, and they've never had a Dota Tate and they've been resected. I think at that point, my first scan afterwards, um, generally, if it's if if it's a fully resected um, um, lung net, I will uh, plan for a scan at six months. And generally, if I don't already have a dotatate, that first scan is is generally a dotatate um, because because I can find I can see that anatomic image. Uh, as well as the functional image. And every now and again, we pick up something that was missed initially. Um, if they've already had a Dota Tate, if they're positive, um, we at least know that um, already. And then I'll follow patients generally with, uh, with CTs, um, CTs of the chest primarily. Most of the time when these tumors recur, they recur locally. Uh, so that's why we, we plan for the for the CTs of the chest. Um, as far as any blood work to follow, um, unless they're having symptoms, um, none of the the markers have been really impressive in my mind for to follow. So things like uh, chromogranin, uh, it, it, we've gotten away from from following this. Um, if uh, sometimes uh, in the mid gut tumors, uh, we look for things like pancreas stat. And I think, I think in the mid gut tumors, that's reasonable, but in the lungs, it really hasn't translated to, to being really useful. I, we're going to be, we're actually uh, going to be involved in a study looking at some of those, uh, some of those markers moving forward. So, but, but again, also it depends on if these markers were elevated preoperatively. So that's really helpful. So if, if you have a marker elevated preoperatively, we take the tumor out, your marker is supposed to go down. And if it starts creeping back up, well, then we know there's there may be trouble brewing. So so, mm -hmm. so if you've got a marker elevated preoperatively, we'll follow that. Um, it, most of the time, the markers are not elevated. Uh, so there's not much to follow other than the scans. Yeah, OK. Uh, so you look at trends. And how often would you do the scans? So most of the time, so for, for the, you know, this is something that needs to go for long term. Uh, and most of the time in, say, in our non-small cell lung cancer world, 
if someone comes in and they have a surgical resection for an early stage non-small cell lung cancer, they may or may not get chemotherapy afterwards. And then, and then they're done with their treatment. And we, we follow them every six months for, for about five years. And then we say, all right, that's, that's it. Your cancer is gone. But we know in the, we know in the neuroendocrine world, these things can occur very late. Um, so, so most of the time I'm, if it's, if it's those typical carcinoid patients completely resected, I'll do a scan at six month intervals for at least the first few years. And then I'll space things out to yearly um, and, and for at least 10 years. Um, and then at that 10 year mark, then we have a conversation about, all right, how do you, how do you feel? Do you want to continue on? Sometimes we continue on sometimes we say, all right, well, if you start developing symptoms again, you know, you come back and we can uh, get you seen sooner. And certainly those patients who I say, come back and see me in a year, if they start getting into trouble at six months, you know, then we, you know, we need to scan earlier. Mm. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned that because this person submitted a question about, um, so they had an upper left lobe of the lung removed and their scans are now showing two millimeter nodules in the right lung. So should they continue on an yearly basis to be monitored? Yeah, I think if, uh, you know, certainly lung nodules, all lung nodules aren't cancer. So we've got to um, kind of uh, keep that in mind. But at the same time, in someone who's had cancer in the past, I, I think it's really important to, you know, keep these things uh, monitored at the very least. Two millimeters is very tiny. Um, and, you know, some radiologists would go, you know, they look at their scan and may not even comment on these things. Um, but I think it's, I think it's, uh, it, they may be too small to biopsy depending on where they're at, but, but, but we need to definitely monitor something like that um, because it, it could be, it, it, it could be part of recurrence. And, and certainly if we catch recurrence early, uh, we can, we can uh, take care of it probably better than if we catch it late. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and you mentioned chromogranulin A as well. So this person actually submitted a question. Can taking protonics cause chromogranulin A to abnormally rise? And if so, when should I stop taking it before having my chromogranulin A test? So, uh, yes, uh, chromogranin A can be caused by um, uh, proton pump inhibitors, such as an elevation can be caused by the PPIs, such as protonics, Nexium, um, uh, Prilosec, uh, et cetera. Um, is there a reason to, uh, to stop taking it? Uh, you know, maybe uh, if you're if you're following the chromogranins, but as I just mentioned, I don't even check them anymore. Uh, so you're on the Prilosec or Protonix for a reason. So if you want to be miserable for for two weeks with reflux, well then then you stop taking it. Uh, but but there's better tests out there if you're if you're going to even get that. I, again, I think uh, I think all of us in the neuroendocrine world were sort of getting away from uh, uh, checking chromogranins because they're, uh, they're no notoriously uh, false. I, I get a lot of consults for elevated chromogranin in, in the absence of anything else. So, um, so I would, uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, um, checking it is, is in my mind is, is worthwhile. Um, and certainly if you're on protonics for, for, for severe reflux, I think it's, I think it's probably best to stay on it. Okay. So look at the whole person. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is an interesting question. Could the recalled CPAP machines impact someone with lung nets who has used this machine and could it cause the appearance of lung nodules on a chest CT? Yeah, this is a, this is an interesting, uh, um, uh, question. I think uh, so. The CPAP, from what I understand, the recalls were were had to do with some of the lining of the of the the, the tube and 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 uh, the potential of ingestion of uh, uh, particles into the airway. Uh, so so that can certainly cause some irritation, local irritation to the to the airway and and potentially worsen breathing. So if someone's using that. Yeah, certainly, you know, the, they can run into respiratory symptoms. 
I don't think it's going to cause any appearance of any lung nodules um, on the CT. Um, that's more into that tissue rather rather the lung actual lung tissue rather than in the airway. Um, I don't I don't know of any any studies that have that have linked one to the other. So, uh, but certainly um, I think the recommendations are is to not use that particular brand of CPAP and uh, and get something get something new. But certainly it can uh, yeah that. Uh, um, there is that risk of developing respiratory issues with, uh, with those machines. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that the machines wouldn't have caused that appearance on the CT likely. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that clarification. And, um, this is another interesting question. Have you seen pulmonary fibrosis after eight years or so with pulmonary neuroendocrine cancer? And if so, like what then? Is it reversible? What are treatment options? And actually, before you answer that question, could you kind of explain what pulmonary fibrosis is? Yeah, so pulmonary fibrosis is another another entity um, that, is, that is somewhat uncommon, uh, and it affects it affects the actual lung tissue rather than the rather than the actual airways. Um, and this can uh, cause problems with progressive shortness of breath. So we see people come in uh, and most of the time we don't know what causes this. So we see people come in with, with this decline, decline, decline over, uh, over many months and years um, uh, with this. Sometimes it's, uh, it's related to occupational uh, exposures. Um, uh, sometimes it's idiopathic, um, meaning we don't know what caused it. Um, so, and most of the time it's not reversible. Um, I think, you know, but there are newer treatments out there. Um, and I would defer to the, to the pulmonologists on this about, about the newer treatments. I think, I think the, the majority of times we try to keep all of this, uh, um, some of the medicines rather than actually reverse things, they keep it from getting worse. Uh, so, so, so yeah, I think there's newer things coming out now. Is it associated with pulmonary neuroendocrine cancers? I, I have not seen any association with it. I mean, can we, can we have two things going on at one time? Certainly. Uh, but it's, uh, I think, I think the biggest thing is, is, uh, you know, checking with the pulmonary folks and seeing what, what they can do. Thank you for that. You know, yeah. So really talking to the pulmonologist and I think that was a subset of this question as well. Um, so here's an, you know, I know we didn't really talk a lot about this, but um, this question came up. Are there any further treatments on the horizon for stage three non-small cell net that's been already treated, especially with chemo, radiation and immunotherapy? Okay, so stage three, non-small cell net so i think we're we may be talking about maybe two different things um normally with what i was talking about earlier you know during the, our presentation was, was those lower grade neuroendocrine tumors that you take out and there's no role for any of the adjuvant the chemo or, or immunotherapy so this really alludes to those non-small cell lung cancers so, um, where we treat remember stage three is that tumor that has spread to the mediastinum uh, and so and is it is not a candidate for surgery so we treat primarily up front with with uh, concurrent chemo and radiation in and, and nowadays we we will do a year of immunotherapy uh, and that has shown to uh, to improve the time to progression and survival um, in these patients. Um, so, so is there anything on the horizon? There's always, there's always things that we're, we're interested in. Some of, some of what we're interested in is, is if these patients develop progressive disease, do we go back on the immunotherapy? Is that, is that beneficial? Do we add other things to immunotherapy that, that, that drug that we use? So there's a few different immunotherapies that we use in that maintenance set. Um, is, you know, can we improve on that? So there's, there's always these newer trials. Actually, right now, the World Lung Conference is, is going on. It was supposed to be in Denver. Um, 
and uh, uh, but but it's it's virtual this year. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we're hopeful hopeful for next year. Uh, but uh, but but yeah, I think there's 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 certainly a lot more interest in that than in the pulmonary carcinoid. Uh, when you look at the research, I counted uh, uh, four research abstracts being presented at the at the world conference this year on on the pulmonary carcinoid tumors um out of out of probably over a thousand abstracts being presented so so it's uh we've got a lot a, a long way to to go and we're hopeful to get more people interested in uh in doing the research in the in for the pulmonary carcinoid tumors great so hopefully more and more things on the horizon um, so here's another um, question I have for this person. I have atypical lung nets. I've tried Everolimus plus capecitabine and temelazolamide. The tumors did not shrink, but rather grew slightly. So what what do I try next? Yeah, so there's, uh, um, you know, again, there's different things. Uh, some of it depends on how the how the tumors grew. Is there one tumor growing? Is there all the tumors growing? Um, Everolimus generally doesn't shrink tumors. Um, it, it, it may stop them from growing, uh, but certainly not everybody tolerates it uh, and it doesn't work for everybody. So if those tumors grow, you try other things. So you can try the capecitabine and temozolomide, um, which is a generally a pretty well tolerated regimen. It's, it's effective in patients with, with the lung tumors. Uh, um, but, but again, that's sort of a finite period where you're going to get benefit from. So, so I mentioned things like PRRT, um, you know, certainly we use lots of PRRT, um, not only for our, our gap net patients, but for our lung net patients as well. Um, there's surafatinib, which is, which, Hopefully, will be FDA approved in the in the coming months. We'll we'll see that could be an option. And then there's always you know the clinical trial options as well. You know we got to remember that uh, if it's growth of one nodule, we you know we can take it out or or, or or do the SBRT to it. So there's you know that's again where where this multidisciplinary approach comes in and really being at a, a center or or being seen at a center where such as Vanderbilt, where we can, where we can sit down with our team and come up with the best approach for, uh, for therapy. In many cases, we can send you home to your, to your oncologist, um, wherever they may be with a roadmap for care. So, so, and we communicate with them and we say, all right, this is what we recommend. And then you come back and see us in six months or you send images or whatnot, and we stay involved in your care. Um, so, so it's, um, so it's really that uh, that partnership between us and the and the and the primary oncologist. So you know you can be across the country, and we can uh, we can sometimes uh, be just as effective as, as if you were here. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I mean, like you said, that multidisciplinary team is important, and it's not uh, two people don't have the exact same treatment plan. So just having that help and. The fact that you're willing to work with a local oncologist is really helpful. Um, so you mentioned PRT, and so this is a question that came up. When might you recommend the LU177 dotate PRT versus the alpha PRT? I know it's not apples so, to apples. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned a little bit about, you know, both of the uh, both the uh, lutetium and the alpha therapy, and there's lots of different alpha therapies out there as well. Um, you know, I think I think the data is kind of kind of early yet on the on the alpha therapy, but it looks really really exciting. Uh, so I think I think you're going to see more and more clinical trials come along, and some of those clinical trials will be for those frontline patients who've never had any therapy. Some of those trials will be for those patients who have already received lutetium and they progress. Uh, and then you say, all right, well, what do, what do I do next? And, and then that will be that alpha therapy. There's a few centers um, that have the alpha therapy available now on a clinical trial. Um, you could go to Europe and, and get alpha therapy outside of a clinical trial. Um, we're, we are probably going to be having uh, uh, an alpha therapy clinical trial 
at Vanderbilt, hopefully first part of next year. So stay tuned. Um, you know, but there's, you know, I think, I think you're going to be seeing more and more from this. And, and so that, I don't know, that doesn't really answer the question. I think, uh, again, the alpha is not approved yet. So, and it's hard to come by. So, so I think if, if you've got your chance at, uh, um, at the Lutetium, you, um, you go for that, um, unless you want to be seen at a center that has a trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Like you said, Alpha's not yet approved. And I'm wondering, what's your success been for uh, getting lung nets uh, patients lutetium? Because some people have told me that they've had insurance deny it. You know, I think I think when it first came out, we were getting a lot of denials, um, and and with. I remember doing a lot of peer to peers with the medical reviewers from the insurance companies and, and, uh, you know, they, you know, they certainly have a different mission than we do. Um, and, um, uh, so, so I, but I think nowadays, I think with more and more data coming out with I mean, guideline approval, you know, this is, this is right on there. They normally follow the NCCN guidelines. A lot of the insurers, and we can point out and say this is on the NCCM guidelines. It's on the NANITS guidelines, and so, so, so it really depends. I, I haven't had much of an issue lately getting getting lung net patients uh, approved for PRRT. Mm -hmm. So, just curious, how many lung nets have you seen get approved for PRT or treated with PRT? Oh gosh. Um, so, so I think at, at Vanderbilt, we've, I think we've treated al almost 200 patients since they've, they've started, uh, at, at when, when we were at, when I was at, in New Orleans, we had treated when I left probably 150 patients or so, um, in, in, in probably 15, 20% of those were, were long. Wow. Okay. That's really hopeful. Okay. Um, so you mentioned clinical trials and I'm so glad that you did, you know, and you went into detail about different ones. So how might someone who's interested in any of those trials you mentioned get more information about the trials or enroll in the trial? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And it really, I think we're all, um, we always try to encourage uh, clinical trials uh, in patients and some, you know, some will go as far to say the best uh, treatment for a patient is a clinical trial. You know, this is how we how we gain our information, how we advance the field, and and we can get access to really you know exciting medications like you know like alpha therapy, for instance. So I so the tr clinical trials vary depending on where you're, where you're at. Um, again, I may have a trial that that they don't have right down the street, and they may have the, a different trial that I don't have. Um, so I think it's it's a matter of speaking with your your specialist and in in uh, seeing what's out there. What you know, generally we know what trials we're excited about and where they're at, um, um, especially for some of the phase phase two and phase three trials. Um, so so really talking with your with your oncologist and seeing what's available at at their site. What's what's out there in other sites? Uh, if you're willing to travel, um, some of the phase one trials are a little less disease specific, um, uh, so they may they there may be options there as well. So it really varies, but it's all boils down to talking with your uh, talking with your doc and seeing what's a, what's available. If you want to get really savvy, there's a website called clinicaltrials.gov that is uh, sometimes more confusing than, than anything else, uh, but uh, uh, encourage people to look at it and at least they can uh, sometimes get an idea, you know, the number of things out there and what's available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And on the site and on the clinical trials, you can actually contact the principal investigator and ask for more information too, correct? Right. Okay. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, of course, you put your email, so you might be getting emails. <laughs> uh, and with that, there's, this, <laughs> this question came up. How can I get a second opinion from you or another doctor specializing in lung nets? This particular person said, my doctor's not sure what to do for me and refu refuses to refer me elsewhere. Yeah, um, certainly you need to be comfortable with your with your treating doctor. And uh, um, 
you know, I, I will frequently refer patients elsewhere uh, if, if I can't help them. And I, and, and, and I think, I think most, most of us recognize our limitations and, and we say, look, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't have that specialty here. I mean, fortunately where I'm at, I, I've, I've got access to pretty much everything, but I, but I think it's important to recognize, you know, you're not the, you know, the, there's other people who may be able to do, uh, do things you're not able to do. Um, and I will frequently, I referred somebody to, uh, out yesterday actually, because it, mainly because of where they lived. And so we contacted the, the surgeon where they're at and said, all right, can you take care of this patient? Uh, and so, so we'll, you know, we, we recognize that. So, um, so many of us do, you know, now, and, you know, starting in 2020, we learned how to do telemedicine. Um, so that's always an option for, for patients. Uh, um, the, the caveat is that, um, most of the time our telemedicine patients need to be in a state where we're licensed. Uh, and so, so if every state has their own medical licensing board and, uh, and, uh, last year they had a lot of temporary licenses and we, we, we got lots of different licenses for many different states, but those have all gone away now. So, um, unfortunately, so that's, you know, that's one of the bad things about it, but sometimes it's, it's worth, you know, traveling to, to see somebody if, if that's, uh, if that's possible, because once we establish care um, and actually see you, then we can continue on with with that. Uh, and so you can you can keep us updated on things, and you go home to your your oncologist and and with our recommendations. And and then the oncologists are always we're more than willing to to, to speak with them as well. Um, you know, sometimes even patients that I. You know, I'll get calls from oncologists that that have no idea or, or or have no plans to refer somebody to me and to ask a question about, hey, I've got this patient with this and this and this. How would you how would you proceed with this? And, and you know, and we're we're happy to speak with them uh, and, and and give them an informal uh, um, uh, recommendation. Uh, but if they want a formal recommendation on things, well, then then we then we have the patient come down and, and be seen. So, so there's a, there's a lot of different ways to, to do this. If your doctor refuses to send you for a second opinion, that's sort of a red flag. Um, so, uh, like I guess that you've got to, you know, be comfortable with your, with where you're at, uh, and have confidence in them. Um, and if not, there's lots of, lots of other people that do the same thing. We do the same thing we do. Thanks for that. Um, I know we're kind of going over. I just wanted to ask a couple last questions. Is there an optimal time or day to get a COVID booster during the 28 uh, somatostatin analog injection cycle? I know this is a kind of shift in topic, but you did mention the boosters and COVID. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a very timely question, and uh, the answer is there's not an optimal time. I think I think it's important to do that and to make time. Uh, so, so if you're, if you're going for your, your, uh, SSA injection and they're offering boosters, get your booster. Okay. Just get it. <laughs> That's important. Okay. And last question is really, what are you most excited about? That's on the horizon for lung nets or, um, and, or what words of hope can you offer to those living with lung nets? Yeah, so we, I mean, we're learning more and more about this, and I'm hopeful, you know, more and more researchers will will get excited about this field. You know, the the incidence of lung nets is is certainly increasing, and we're all recognizing that. And and so as that, you know, as the incidence increases, hopefully, you know, we'll get uh, more and more options for trials. I mean, I mentioned the surafatinib is uh, is coming. Uh, you know, the, there's the alpha therapy that's coming. We, I talked about that serifatinib plus the immunotherapy trial. Uh, we didn't even mention immunotherapy. Uh, you know, that could potentially be an option for, for patients. Uh, so these are, these are certainly things that, that we look for. We've got other clinical trials that, that, uh, that are including lung nets. Um, you know, so, so there's lots of things that, um, that, are coming down the pipeline and we'll just see if, if they pan out. And I think, you know, the way we treat, you know, cancers 
nowadays are, are much different than we treated five, 10 years ago. And the hope is in five or 10 years, what I'm doing today probably won't be relevant and we'll have something totally new. Um, but so it's a matter of staying on top of things. I think any, as far as words of hope, I, th I think, you know, there's, there's lots of, uh, I, I think, I think one, you know, generally speaking, you've got a lot of support, you know, between, between black nets and other organizations. So I think, you know, you know, it's, it's really interesting that neuroendocrine community, the patient community is a very close knit uh, community. And I love working with the net patients and they come armed with so many questions, so many good questions and, and they've done their research in the, in the majority of times, you know, the, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a, uh, of a slower growing cancer. So we've got, we've got time to really sort all this out and patients have time to learn and go get other opinions, um, you, you know, either from, you know, other specialists and, or, you know, other parts of the country or, or even with their, even locally. Um, so I think there's, there's lots of things that we can, we can do. Um, sometimes there's things that we say, you know, we don't need to do anything right now and just offer that reassurance. And, um, you know, but, but it's really, it's really nice to, to see this, uh, community setting, uh, in the neuroendocrine world, uh, and, and also the community within the neuroendocrine physician world. And we all kind of, we all kind of know each other. And, and, uh, you know, yesterday I shot off an email to a colleague at, in Birmingham and I said, can you see this patient? And, and, you know, so, you know, and I talked to, you know, other docs and, and, and they feel the same way and they're always, you know, more than willing to take time out of their day, do, do these kind of things uh, to help educate and help a answer questions. And, uh, you know, we're always, uh, you know, we're always happy to help. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez, for this really informative session, for your words of hope, your willingness to collaborate, um, your dedication to research and patient care. It's just always such a pleasure to have you, and we just thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Well, thank you for uh, you know all that you do. Um, you know, I think your your organization is is very helpful in uh, in giving patients hope as well. You know, so I'm always happy to help. Um, you know, I provided my email on that last slide. Feel feel free to uh, you know send uh, um, send me any. Uh, uh, questions about how to get in. Um, you know, generally we can get patients in really fast. Uh, um, you know, the, you know, again, I see primarily the lung nets, but I also, you know, I also spent, spent almost a decade seeing, seeing all of the neuroendocrine tumors right now. They're, they're, uh, you know, between myself and Dr. Nanu Das, we kind of, we kind of see everything. So, uh, yeah. so uh, he's also excellent uh, and you'll be in great hands if you get to see him as well. So, so I, um, I encourage people to reach out um, and, uh, and we'll see how we can help. Yeah, they can come visit you in Nashville, see, eat some good food and enjoy the music and yes. leave in an appointment with you. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you again for um, joining us today. And now I'm gonna send it back to you, Lindsay, in the studio. Thank you, Lisa. Be sure you're following LACNETS on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find us with the handle at LACNETS. Stay up to date on upcoming webinars and net news. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and can be viewed on a YouTube channel shortly after the live broadcast. You can find it at bit.ly slash LACNETS YouTube. Before I pass it off to Lisa to close us out, I'd like to remind our viewers that these webinars are done for educational purposes only and do not substitute for medical advice. Please talk to your medical team if you have any questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. We all have our own opinions, and these are our own opinions. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of LACNET. Thank you so much, and I'm going to pass it back to Lisa. Thank you, Lindsay. We understand that these may be challenging times, and we offer many programs and resources, including our weekly NET support group, a dedicated caregiver-only support group, Net Vitals, a downloadable patient physician communication tool to help you prepare for your medical appointments, and health coaching available to net patients or caregivers. We encourage you to go to our website, lacnets.org, to find out more information about our programs, view resources, read blogs, take net quizzes, and much, much more.
The virtual world has definitely made it easier to access many net educational programs, like today's webinar. It's also easier to join a support group since many support groups are meeting virtually and open to people across the country. I've been supporting my husband who's been living with NETS for the past six years, and the connections I've made through the support groups have really been life-changing. There are many support groups out there, locally and nationally, that are available for you to connect with. So if you need help getting connected, feel free to reach out to us and we can help. We want you to know that you are not alone. We also have an incredible lineup of speakers for the rest of 2021. In October, we're pleased to have the CEO of the nonprofit Triage Cancer, Joanna Morales, join us to discuss navigating health and disability insurance. Our November Net Cancer Day Symposium will focus on patient advocacy with patient advocates Josh Mailman and Cindy Lovelace, as well as patient physician Dr. Mark Lewis. And in December, Chaplain Michael Echelon will join us once again to close out our year with an inspirational talk titled Riding the Cancer Wave, Spiritually Speaking. Thanks again to our presenter, Dr. Robert Ramirez, to Rich at TVP Live, and to all of you for joining us today. We hope you can join us again next month. Goodbye. Bye.